Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. I'm thankful that you join us tonight as we beginning as we begin this uh, first full week in September. Uh, it is a privilege for us to get together. It's a privilege for me to be able to share with you from God's Word. We're going to continue try to finish uh, Psalm 111, uh, Psalm 110, and 111. Then we'll see, we probably get back into the Gospel of Mark after that, but just wanted to just take a moment and uh, uh, look at one of the classical uh, uh, Messiah Psalms uh, in Scripture. That's Psalm 110. Um, I read recently a story uh, about a boy named Brian uh, and, who had bothered his parents for weeks about getting a watch for Christmas. Uh, and uh, he kept on asking, uh, you know, like little boys are going to do, I want to watch, I want to watch, I want to watch, I want this watch, I want this watch, I want this watch, Apple Watch, Apple Watch, Apple Watch. And finally his dad said, Brian, if you mention that watch to us again, you're not going to get it, so quit bit bugging us. So one night, Brian's parents asked him to uh, lead the prayer at dinner, and Brian said, I'd like to quote a scripture verse before I pray. Mark Chapter 13, verse 37. I say unto you what I've already told you before. Watch. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, anyway, uh, so the, uh, as we look to God's Word, uh, we certainly can find what uh, all kinds of different things. But um, one of the things that the New Testament church found in Psalm 110 was a picture of of the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And as the church historically has, has uh, read Psalm 110, we read it through the lens of Jesus Christ the King and how the King cares for us. So let me read Psalm 110 and uh, uh, then kind of draw from it uh, some things that we can do with this psalm. So Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of His wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, He shall lift up. The head. All right, so you look at Psalm 110, um, Psalm 110, verse uh, 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, David is the one who's writing this psalm, I believe, and, and he's announcing uh, miraculously, powerfully, supernaturally, uh, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's announcing the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. And when, um, uh, when Peter, at the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when he's preaching his sermon, uh, he alludes, he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. He says, the Lord said to my Lord, you shall sit at uh, my footstool until I, uh, sit at my, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your, uh, your enemies your footstool. Uh, Peter quoted that and said, well, David is saying, Lord... Uh, to someone else. Who's he saying Lord to? He's saying Lord to Jesus, Peter said. And that's historically how the church interpreted throughout the New Testament, but also early church that David is writing. He said, the Lord said to my Lord. Um, who's he talking about? Who is my Lord? Who's uh, He's talking about Jesus. And this psalm, even before the birth of Jesus was an enthronement psalm. It's, it's a messianic psalm. Uh, but as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we read this and, and just kind of highlight the parts. He says, uh, Jesus, if we take Jesus as the theme in verses 1 through 7, and we should, 
uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. He's talking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. He's going to make the enemies of the Lord and of the Trinity, the Godhead, his footstool. Um, the Lord shall send uh, the rod of your strength out of Zion. Jesus is going to uh, reign supreme and even in his um, enthronement in heaven awaiting his second coming, he still is exalted uh, supreme and he is ruling in the midst of the enemies. Verse 3 uh, and 4 talk about uh, relationship with Jesus and his people. Uh, and then verses 5 through 6 talking about the second coming of Christ and how Jesus will return with power and destroy all enemies of God. All right, so that being said, what do we do with this? All right, and, and I just, I mean, that, that's, that's the exegesis. One and two, introduction, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of the throne of God. He is the Lord. Verses three through three and four, uh, relationship with Jesus, the King, and us. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then verses five through seven, uh, what Jesus is going to do when he comes again uh, in the clouds of glory. All right, so as followers of Jesus, how do we take Psalm 110? First thing we need to do is we need to celebrate the birth of the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ himself, the King who would deliver beauty in the wasteland of struggle, pain, and death. Jesus has come. Micah 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem of Phathra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be the ruler in Israel, who's going forth are from old, from everlasting. The sun's appearing, Jesus' coming, means that Jesus the Lord and King of creation to whom we and all creation is accountable chose to take our place of judgment uh, uh, and, and went to a cross to provide a relationship between sinners like you and me and a holy God. The sun's appearing reveals the infinite mobility and passion of his love for sinners like you and me to be made fit for the family of God so that we are no longer separate and strangers to the commonwealth of Israel and the covenant of promise, but now we are sons and daughters of God. Yes, we need to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ the King. We celebrate because this is the inauguration of God's reign upon the earth, and it will come to its completion as vice, verses seven through uh, uh, verse uh, 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 verses uh, 5 through 7 teach us it will come to a completion and Jesus will uh, bodily, literally, physically reign supreme as he does eternally right now. We should celebrate because the birth of the king means a transformation in our lives. The enemies will be made the footstool. His strength has come out of Zion. He will set right what has been wrong. Jesus has come. We celebrate the birth of the King. As followers of Jesus, every day we should be celebrating the birth of the King, the incarnation of Christ that sets the path for sinners like us to be made fit for God's family. There's nothing in you, nothing in me that makes us right in the sight of God, but it is Jesus who has come to make sin the greatest enemy of all humanity, makes sin uh, 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 dis to destroy sin and death and set us in right relationship with God the Father. So we celebrate Jesus and the birth of the King. Uh, we celebrate that God's love comes to set life right through Jesus. God's love comes to set life right through Jesus. We see in this, this, uh, this psalm uh, throughout all seven verses, this, this turnaround that the king is going to do. The king is born, the king comes, the king uh, restores God's reign, the king um, uh, sets right what is wrong. Uh, God's love has come to set uh, right what has been wrong. Verses five through seven is bloody and it's gross and, and, and it's offensive to 21st century ears in a, in, in a Western world, but it is a picture of Jesus setting right what sin and, and uh, opposition and rebellion against God has done. He is, he, he, the, Lord is at, uh, the Lord is at the king, Jesus' right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath, wrath against sin and wrath against the devil's 
uh, work. He shall judge among the nations, and he shall fa- fill the place of dead bodies. Hell is going to be a place that is filled with judgment, and that judgment comes rightly and truly. Uh, and when you oppose God, you will suffer judgment. And, and that's setting things right. We live in a culture today where we think everybody gets a pass on holiness, and nobody gets a pass on holiness. We think everybody gets a pass on holiness. Nobody does, not you, not me. The only thing that stands between us and judgment is that Jesus is our king. But for those to whom Jesus is, uh, to those for whom Jesus is not king, wrath is coming. That's setting things right. The king has come to set things right. That's what God's love does. And God's love sets right what has been made wrong by sin. So uh, we uh, celebrate um, the birth of the king because it sets us right in the sight of God. But also uh, we celebrate uh, that David saw God talking with Jesus in the halls of heaven. That, that's, what, that's what David saw. And he celebrated the king who sets life right. Today we celebrate the king's birth because he sets our lives right, but we also celebrate the birth of our peace. So we celebrate uh, this wondrous work of God's grace that uh, God's saying to Jesus, hey, I want you to sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And, uh, and then all of verses 1 through 7 teach us this conversation, the outworking of this conversation, uh, the ultimate um, um, uh, victory, verses 5 through 7, um, uh, that is uh, picturesque <laughs> to say the least, but verses uh, 3 and 4 talk to us about peace. So uh, in verse 4 especially, uh, Jesus is the high priest. And he's high priest in all eternity. He's the high priest uh, uh, in the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was back in Abraham's day. And uh, Melchizedek was a priest uh, not established by uh, religious authority, but established by God himself. God made Melchizedek a priest. There wasn't any other agent other than God who made Melchizedek a priest. So when um, when the psalmist says that, that Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he's talking about the eternality of Jesus as the great high priest. Um, and as the high priest of, of eternity, Jesus has come to care for the people under his charge uh, to lead them to faithfulness, to lead them to victory. That's what Christ has done. That's what Christ will do forever for us. As our high priest, it's not only an eternal peace that he provides, but the Prince of Peace also provides personal, practical peace in our life. It's a peace that no one other than the author of life could give us, a peace uh, that only the King of creation can deliver. Jesus is determined to give us that peace uh, and to give it to us personally because we belong to him. We're under his charge as, as his followers uh, made fit for God's family through faith in Him. It's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews chapter 4, that seeing then that we have such a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God, who has passed through the heavens, let us hold fast to our confession, for we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but he was tested in every point, even as we are, yet he never sinned. Therefore, let us come before the throne of grace, come boldly before the throne of grace, that we might find the grace and the mercy that will help us in our time of need. That's peace, that Jesus is interceding and and is our advocate, and he's standing between us and danger. Um, Christ's uh, coming uh, is, is the offer of celebration. The king has been born. Uh, the king who sets life right has been born. Uh, the king who delivers an eternal and personal peace has been born. Christ knows our hearts and he cares intimately for our needs. He's not callous to our shattered lives, our broken dreams. He's not hardened to the cry for help in difficult days. He knows what we're going through and he moves to help. Christ's coming is about His great love and comfort being poured out upon us. It's not mere sentimentality, for sentimentality is enjoyment without obligation. The peace of Christ is like a wind 
to a boat that's languishing at sea. It's like a gift of a job to a man who's jobless, been jobless for years. It's the clasp of a friend's hand in time of hurt. It's Christ's promise that God will stand by us in the day of our need, strengthen our hearts, and make us more than a conqueror. Friends, Jesus is the king, and he changes everything. And David saw it, and he proclaimed it, and now we celebrate it. Today, God offers hope and confidence of his loving rescue through faith in Jesus Christ, who's brought us into his family. And we live as a willing sacrifice, a volunteer in verse 3, um, uh, like, like the living sacrifice in, in Paul's letter to the Roman church in, in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service of worship. Verse 3 says that we are volunteers. That's, that's, that's like living sacrifices. And we present ourselves to the King, to Jesus Christ, as His people on mission for Him. So today we celebrate the King who sets our lives right and gives us the peace that is perfect and personal. And we give ourselves to Him as His volunteers to serve Him on mission in the world. Let's celebrate today. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless y'all. Good night.